Well, if you're new with us this morning, we continue a series that we're calling Follow Me, and it's a study through the New Testament Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark. We've been working our way steadily through that book, and I want to invite you to pull out your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. Mark 6, 30 through 44. If you need a Bible, there are several on hand there in the seat backs in front of you, and so feel free to use one of those Bibles. You'll find the passage on page 841. You'll remember that last week, when we left off, we left off with a scene of the grotesque, immoral birthday feast thrown by King Herod. Remember that? A feast which led, literally led to the beheading of John the Baptist. This week, by contrast, we read of a different kind of feast thrown by King Jesus. This is the feast that you want to be at. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. I wonder when you have the opportunity to enjoy maybe a home-cooked meal. Uh, There around the dinner table, surrounded by friends and family members. Just a a great home-cooked meal. I wonder, what kind of food do you most look forward to eating in that kind of a meal? True confession for me, it's the bread. It's the bread. I got an amen from that, right? My wife makes the most delicious sourdough bread. Yeah. And there is nothing quite as close to heaven as when that bread comes fresh out of the oven, still hot, just sliced, just smothered in butter. Mmm. But Houston, there's a problem. Because for me, bread equals carbohydrates, right? Like bread equals waistline challenges. Uh, It's like modern dietary sensibilities have ruined our enjoyment of bread. Isn't that true? Um, We see bread, we think carbs. However, for ancient people, for people in Jesus' day, Bread was not just an optional luxury. Bread was the staple food. Bread wasn't just a side dish. Bread was at the the center of the dish. It was central to the meal. Bread represented sustenance and nourishment and life. And so it's no accident that one of Jesus' most famous miracles has to do with bread. 
Jesus intends, I think, to teach us some profound lessons about himself as he multiplies this food for thousands of people. Now, you've heard, of course, that Jesus teaches through parables. But did you know as well that Jesus teaches through his miracles? Have you ever noticed in the Gospels that we never see Jesus just like working random miracles for miracles' sake? You never see Jesus being like, look what I can do and make somebody levitate or something, right? Just for the fun of it. You just never see that. No, Jesus' miracles are always revelatory. They're always revealing something about himself. And they're teaching us important truths about the kingdom of God. It's the same here with the feeding of the 5,000 miracle. This miracle is designed to teach us things. So you say, well, what does it teach us exactly? Well, here's what I want to do this morning. First, let's walk through the story bit by bit and just sort of savor the details. But then I want to explore three ways that Jesus relates to bread. Okay, that's where we're going. First, the story. As we pick up the storyline, remember that the 12 apostles had been sent out earlier by Jesus, and they were supposed to go out and teach like Jesus taught and cast out demons and heal. And now the disciples come back, and they are so excited to debrief with Jesus about all that they had done. So, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So they return, and we can only imagine they must have been exhausted after a mission like this. And Jesus knows this. Jesus knows that they need to recharge, they need to recalibrate, they need to sharpen the saw, as it were. And so Jesus invites his disciples to take a break from the pressing crowds, come away with him, get into the escape vehicle, that is the boat, and go off to some other lonely stretch of the shore to get some R&R. &R. Verse 31. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place. Rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a des desolate place by themselves. It's a great plan. Rest is important, is it not? Here's the problem. Apparently the crowds figure out where they're going. And a bunch of people get there first. It's like, have you ever been the, maybe in a situation where you tried to escape your busy work office environment to actually get some work done? So you go off to a coffee shop somewhere, you get all settled in, you look up and you realize there's like three of your colleagues at that coffee shop. They're trying to get away from everyone too. In the same way here, as Jesus and the disciples try to get away, they approach the shoreline and they realize word has spread and all the people had sprinted ahead onto the shore and they're ready to meet them once they land. Verse 33. Now many saw them going and recognized them and they ran there on foot from all the towns and they got there ahead of them. Let me ask you, how would you react if you were Jesus in this moment? You're just trying to arrange a little retreat for your disciples. You're just trying to get away because your disciples are exhausted. You're exhausted. But these crowds will give you absolutely no space. Nobody in these crowds has read the book Boundaries, right? And here you are in the boat trying to get to the retreat. You get to the shore and the crowds are there. How would you react? How would most people react? Most people in that moment, in that situation would reprimand these crowds. They'd be angry at these crowds. Or maybe they would at least try to stay in the boat and get out of there to some other place away from the crowds. But not Jesus. We get a glimpse right into the very heart of Jesus right there in verse 34. Look there. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. I want you to notice a few things here. Precisely when we would expect Jesus to be frustrated, Jesus actually experiences deep compassion for these crowds. Well, now that's awesome. We're going to get some... Amen. 
we're going to get sound effects during this sermon. <laughs> we'll see how this matches up. That's pretty awesome. Just when these crowds are most annoying and needy, that's precisely when we see Jesus showing this great compassion. You know, that's a really encouraging thing for us today, isn't it? I wonder, have you ever wondered whether you're annoying to Jesus? I've wondered that about myself. Have you, have you ever wondered whether you've tried Jesus' patience just a little too much? Whether you've finally reached the end of his sympathy and patience? Maybe you wonder sometimes whether you've literally worn Jesus out. He's finally grown tired of you. You've finally overstayed your welcome. You've exhausted his patience. Maybe sometimes you felt like, you know what? Maybe I'm just a drag on Jesus' time because I'm so very needy. Anybody ever felt like that? If you've ever felt like that, here's the truth. According to this text, in our greatest moments of neediness, Jesus' heart is filled with compassion towards us, and he is endlessly eager to give us help, to give you help. Listen, you can't wear Jesus out. It's impossible. Why? Because his compassion always outruns our need. So this morning, if you've assumed that Jesus is done with you, if you assume that he's just tired of you, you need to think again. Your Savior is ready for you with open arms of compassion. Notice also in the story that though Jesus will eventually give these crowds bread, meeting their physical needs, the first thing that he gives them is his word. In verse 34 tells us that when he sees them and he has compassion on them and sees that they're like sheep without a shepherd, what's the first thing he gives them? We read, he began to teach them many things. So in triaging all of their needs, Jesus sees that their primary need is for his teaching. And this reminds us, doesn't it, that in our own hierarchy of needs this morning, one of our greatest needs is to hear the word of Christ in the scriptures. Well, this teaching goes on for some time, and eventually the disciples notice a very practical and logistical problem there in verse 35. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. It's a reasonable observation, isn't it? They're out there in the middle of nowhere. The crowds have been there a long time. It's getting late. People are going to get hungry and cranky. Send them away. The disciples here are acting like stereotypical male problem solvers. They're asking like, how can I solve this problem without personally getting involved? Right? <laughs> Send them away. That's the answer. And Jesus says something shocking, doesn't he? Verse 37. Here it comes. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? In this little section, Jesus leads his disciples into a, 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 a sort of notorious dilemma. He puts them in a pickle. He intentionally tells them to meet a need that they cannot meet. So they do this quick assessment, they run some calculations, they conclude that to feed this many people in this setting would cost 200 denarii. Now, you need to know that a denarius is a day's pay for a day laborer. And so if you kind of did some calculations, did the math, assuming, say, that's in our day, like 50 bucks a day, then the disciples are basically asking Jesus, like, where are we going to get $10,000 to feed all these people? Where are we going to get that kind of money to feed this crowd? It's outrageous. And that's exactly the point, isn't it? The task is just too big for them. I wonder for you, has God ever asked you to do something well beyond your capacities or capabilities to do? Maybe God called you to share the gospel with someone, but you stumble over your words. 
Maybe God called you to serve some person who's absolutely resistant and cranky. Maybe God called you to start a ministry when all the odds were against you, or to take a risk despite all the naysayers, or to pray for something out of the bounds of what is reasonable. In those moments when we are least capable and least competent, in those moments, God tends to shine His glory the most, doesn't He? As the Scriptures say, in, his, in our weakness, He is strong. Well, that's the case with the disciples here. Jesus begins to address this impossible need here by starting with what the disciples actually do have. Verse 38. And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. And then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. Friends, wouldn't you love to get into a time-traveling DeLorean Yes, that's a Back to the Future reference. And go back in time to this scene and watch Jesus perform this miracle and see, like, how mechanically did this work? Mark doesn't sensationalize anything here. Did you notice that? He just records what happened. The description is almost underwhelming. And it just goes to show us that this is actually a historical account. Jesus asked the disciples to do an inventory. What do we have, guys? He asks. They come back with five loaves of bread, probably pita-sized flatbread, plus two smoked or dried fish. Now, John's gospel informs us that they actually confiscate the food from some poor kid from, from his lunchbox, right? That's where they got the food. Jesus instructs the people to sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Now, you need to know that word groups there in verse 40. It literally means dining parties. So he has the people sit down in dining parties. It's like Jesus is, sit, is, is uh, <clears throat> sitting the various parties down in sort of like an outdoor restaurant, and he is about to serve a feast. And then he takes the bread, and he prays a blessing. Very likely, Jesus would have prayed an ancient Jewish prayer, prayed very commonly over meals. He would have said something like, Praise be to you, O Lord, our God, King of the world, who makes bread to come forth from the earth and who provides for all that you have created. He would have prayed something like that. Then he breaks the bread and gives it to the disciples who spread it among the groups of people. The fish are divided and spread out as well. And we're told nothing more. We're just told that it happens. Don't you wonder? Like, did the bread grow? Like he broke it and then it would like grow? Or we're told baskets are involved. Did he break the bread and the fish and put it into baskets and then the next time person, somebody glanced over, there was just more in the basket? We literally don't know. In fact, it's interesting, one thing that Mark doesn't say. He doesn't say the people were amazed by this miracle. Usually in Mark, when a miracle is performed, the people, we read every time, the people are amazed. He doesn't say that here. You almost get the impression that the people didn't even quite realize what was happening. Like when Jesus turns water into wine at that wedding, remember? The guests of the wedding have no idea they are drinking miracle wine. All they know is this wine is really good. Maybe in a similar way here in this story. These people don't perhaps know that this is miracle bread, but they do know one thing. They're full, and this food is good. Did you notice verse 42 says, all the people were satisfied. All they know is this bread and this fish are delicious, and I'm stuffed, and this food came from Jesus. In fact, there was a lot of leftovers, 12 baskets were told. These baskets are probably the word for large, heavy baskets used for carrying things. It may have even been fishermen's baskets. Verse 43, and they 
took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Uh, please note that 5,000 men does not count or include the women and children who were most certainly there. So the number of people fed could be over twice that much. Could be 10,000 people or more. So here's the bottom line. Five loaves and two fish from the hands of Jesus leave a crowd of thousands of people satisfied and happy and full. It's a picture of radical, abundant blessing. So what do we learn? In between the screaming jets overhead, what do we learn? Remember, Jesus not only taught through parables, Jesus also taught through his miracles. And so, what do we learn in this very famous miracle? I want to suggest three ways that Jesus relates to bread. Three ways that Jesus relates to bread. Each of these has implication for our lives. Number one, Jesus leads his people to bread. Jesus leads his people to bread. Did you notice in the story in verse 34, Jesus has compassion on the people because, as we're told there, they were like sheep without a shepherd, like sheep without a shepherd. But then Jesus immediately steps forward to lead them as the shepherd that they truly need. The story communicates this because we are told repeatedly at the beginning of the story that the people were in a desert place. And yet, up in verse 39, Jesus commands the people to sit down in what? Green grass. Did you notice that? Sit down in green grass. What's that all about? Well, it's as though Jesus, the shepherd, has led these people, his sheep, to the green pastures where they can now feed. He's the great shepherd. He's the leader that they need. It reminds me, of course, of Psalm 23. You know that psalm, don't you? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in what? Green pastures. This story is a picture of that. Now we might think, oh, how sweet. A gentle, meek, and mild shepherd leading the fluffy white sheep to the grass, all of it in pastel colors. Actually, in reality, ancient shepherds were anything but feeble and scrawny. Ancient shepherds in Jesus' day were competent, strong, leather-handed security guards. They were trained veterinarians. They were charged with protecting and leading and nourishing valuable commodities, namely the flocks. Israel's greatest leaders in their history were all shepherds. Do you realize that? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, what was their vocation? Shepherds. Moses was a shepherd. David was a what? A shepherd. This image of a shepherd becomes a prominent symbol in the Old Testament for strong, competent, responsible leadership. The kind of leaders that God wanted to position over his people to lead them well. And yet, as we see in the Old Testament, the shepherds of Israel failed the people of God. We see this especially in places like Ezekiel chapter 34, where God decries the fact that Israel's leaders, their shepherds, had failed to shepherd his people well. Let me give you a taste of Ezekiel 34 so you can see this. <clears throat> Ezekiel 34, beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God. Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. So Israel's shepherds had failed them over and over again, and God decries this very fact, and yet, and yet, in that very same chapter, Ezekiel 34, 
God promises that one day he will send a true shepherd for the people. Ezekiel 34, beginning in verse 22, says, I will rescue my flock, God says. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David. Now, this is written after David's life. So, one like David, right? One in the line of David. My shepherd David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Next slide. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. God says, I will send a shepherd like David, and he will feed them like they should have been fed. And here's what I want you to see, brothers and sisters. Here in Mark chapter 6, in this wonderful story, we see that this true shepherd who actually comes to feed his people is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Jesus. Jesus steps forward with compassion for his people that the other shepherds should have had. And Jesus leads them to green pastures and feeds them with his food. And Jesus leads us too. Now, look, I think you would agree. People all over the world long for good leadership. Leaders with integrity. You and I are desperate, are we not, in our lives for good leadership. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that the greatest leader who has ever walked the earth offers to lead you personally day by day as you follow him. It's Jesus, our great shepherd. The greatest leader who ever lived sees you with his compassion and invites you to follow him. The question is, will you follow Jesus, the great shepherd? Will you listen to his word? Will you submit your life to his daily direction? What a gift. What a gift to have a leader that strong who's also compassionate and sees us in our desperate need. And yet he's available for each and every one of us. How many people in our day spend really big bucks just to find a life coach or a mentor or a counselor of some sort to guide them and lead them in some way? And yet we have a shepherd savior who offers his guidance to us without any payment. Because he's already paid the cost. Here's how Jesus puts it in John 10, 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Brothers and sisters, here's a practical suggestion. Why not take Psalm 23, the psalm I read earlier, the Lord is my shepherd, famous psalm. Read Psalm 23 every day this week. Perhaps read it multiple times, once in the morning, once at night. Let it start to swim around in your heart and mind. And then notice carefully in your week how Jesus leads you. Just notice the rhythms of his leadership and his shepherding in your life, how he cares for you, how he guides you, how he speaks to you. He's our great shepherd. As our shepherd, Jesus leads his people to bread. That's number one. But notice, secondly, Jesus also satisfies his people with bread. Jesus satisfies his people with bread. This story should immediately remind us of some Old Testament provision miracles. You say, what are you talking about? Well, for instance, the prophet Elisha. Did you know that Elisha, the prophet, fed 100 men with 20 barley loaves and had leftovers? It was a miracle. Let me remind you of it. 2 Kings chapter 4. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God, that's Elisha, bread from the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them and they ate and had some left. According to the word of the Lord. But that's a miracle. Like Elisha has something to point to and say, that's miraculous. He's like, I fed, by God's power, a hundred men with 20 barley loaves and had a bunch of leftovers? By contrast, Jesus feeds 5,000 men with only five loaves and there's 12 heaping basketfuls left over. Jesus is greater than Elisha. That's the point. And then we see in our story that Jesus is also greater than Moses. You know, there's several clues in the story 
that remind us of God feeding the Israelites with manna in the desert under Moses. For instance, Mark tells us three times in the story that Jesus and the disciples and the people are in a desolate place. You see that in verse 31, verse 32, verse 35. They're in a desolate place. That word desolate place is sometimes translated, they're in a wilderness. So they're in a wilderness, just like Israel of old traveled in a desert wilderness. And yet, notice also, just like Moses divided the people of Israel into groupings of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. You can go to Exodus 18 to see that. He divided them into these groupings in the same way here. Jesus divides the people into groups of a hundreds and fifties. And just like God provides the Israelites with miracle bread with regard to that manna, and miracle meat with the quail. Here Jesus provides miraculous bread to the people as well as miracle meat with the fish. But here's what's different between the story about the manna and Jesus' miracle here. Remember with the manna, they were only supposed to collect enough for, for how long? For that very day, right? You only collect enough, no leftovers. Only enough to sustain you for that day. And if there's any leftovers and you collect too much, it's going to be eaten by worms the next day. Contrast that with Jesus' feast here. Jesus is like, you eat as much as you want, free refills, till you're stuffed, and I'm going to have 12 basketfuls of leftovers of my food. It's as if to say, Someone greater than Moses is here. Friends, are you struck by the idea that the people there in the story are satisfied after eating Jesus' meal? I draw your attention back to verse 42. It tells us they are, everyone was satisfied. That word means they were stuffed. It's like when you eat a meal. Have you ever had this happen to you? You eat a meal at a restaurant. And you eat and eat and eat, and the meal is so good, and you're so stuffed that you just have to put back to the table and breathe. And then the waiter comes up with the most ludicrous question, would you like to see the dessert menu? <laughs> and you're like, are you crazy? Of course not. Like, you're stuffed. You're so full. Well, apparently here at this feast that Jesus offers that day in the grassy desert, his feast left thousands of people satisfied like that. You say, what's the point? Well, I think it's a picture. Brothers and sisters, I think it's a picture that the abundant Christian life that Jesus offers us is meant to satisfy our souls. Let me tell you a little secret. Contrary to Majority opinion in some cases. Christians don't have to be grumpy. And the Christian life doesn't have to be this curmudgeon experience. No, this story reminds us if you're a Christian, you've encountered the greatest kind of life you could ever live. You've been given the abundant life of Jesus. It's a feast. And we're meant to live satisfying Christian lives as we receive from Jesus' hands. I wonder today, would you describe your Christian life as satisfying? Would you describe your soul as full? Now, to be sure, our souls will never be fully satisfied until heaven until we experience the heavenly feast, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb, that is, right? In heavenly glory for all eternity, we will experience a sort of fullness like, like nothing ever before, a fullness in the presence of God forever. And that's true. And Jesus' feast here, I really believe, is meant to be a sort of foretaste or a picture pointing us to that heavenly feast. All that's true. But at the same time, isn't it also true that in the meantime, Jesus intends us to experience to some degree this soul level satisfaction of life in him, especially as we're nourished by him, like those full, content people as they sat there in that glorious picnic, 
that day in the story. Think with me for just a moment about just how satisfying the Christian life really should be. I mean, on the one hand, if you think about it, every true Christian has been forgiven of all of their sins, past, present, and future, through the final work of Jesus Christ for us on the cross. That means we get to live every single day of our lives with this acute awareness that we've been forgiven and freed of our guilt and our shame, and we can walk with a skip in our step. Furthermore, every Christian believer has a truly new identity in Jesus Christ. Like we've got nothing to prove when it comes to our identity because we've been chosen, we've been redeemed, we've been adopted, we've been valued. And every Christian believer also has purpose and meaning to what they do. Purpose in our lives. Think about it. Even the most menial tasks in our everyday lives are everywhere shot through with ultimate meaning. Everything has meaning for us because we pursue everything we do for the glory of God. Look, we Christians have peace that passes all understanding. We have joy that's unshakable. We have hope that is sure. Our eternity is very, very bright. We have God's very presence in our lives by His Spirit. We get to read God's Word every day. Uh, We get the supportive community of the church coming around us. We get to experience the tangible benefits of living within God's moral parameters. I mean, there's just a lot of practical blessing to just doing your life God's way. It's a really good life. And maybe more than anything else, Christian believers have a sense in their deepest heart that they have been loved by Almighty God in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. We are loved. So you start to think it through. And you start to realize, well, now come to think of it. The Christian life really is a satisfying life, isn't it? It's kind of like being so full that you have to turn away the dessert menu. No, thanks. I'm full. Maybe you ask, well, if that's true, Pastor Eric, then why do I so often not experience the abundant satisfying life of Jesus that you're talking about? Well, maybe for some of us, it's because we're so distracted. Like when you're on vacation, but your vacation is spoiled because you won't stop thinking about work. For some of us, we're so busy with the things of this world that we never actually sit down to just eat Jesus' meal. Maybe for others of us, it could be that we keep eating so much junk food of the sin and ways of this world that it keeps us from truly enjoying the pure pleasures of the life that Jesus offers. We're kind of like that boy Edmund in the Chronicle of Narnia books. Remember Edmund, he gets into Narnia and the, the, the white witch ends up tempting him to eat this magical food called Turkish delight. And once he tastes the Turkish delight, he can't stop thinking about it anymore. He just wants to eat that, and it spoils his taste for for the real food that he needs. Sin spoils our taste for Jesus' bread. Look, whatever is keeping you this morning from Jesus' satisfying life today, I believe God wants you to know that Jesus offers you this abundant life, and you can have it. It's available. Picture yourself there in the story. Like literally, vividly, imagine you're there on that day in the text, in the story. You're sitting there on that hillside. You're organized into one of those groups of 50 or 100, sitting among your friends in your dining party, as it were, out under the blue sky. And Jesus Christ comes over to your group and he breaks off some bread and he hands it to you. And he says, eat. Eat. And you eat and you eat and you feast until you're so full. And then you sit back next to some of your friends and you laugh. And you listen some more as Jesus continues on with his teaching. This is a picture of the satisfying Christian life of being fed and led by Jesus. And listen, friends, it's all yours for the taking. If you're not experiencing it today, why not ask Jesus for more? Why not just be like, Jesus, I'm like, I know you want me to have this kind of abundant life. Could I have seconds? 
Jesus leads his people to bread. Jesus satisfies his people with bread. Notice finally, number three, Jesus is the bread. Jesus is the bread. Quickly, here's the greatest lesson of this story. I believe the bread that Jesus offers to the people is a picture of himself given to us through his sacrifice for us on the cross. You say, where do you get that? Well, we see some clues of this in the verbs that are used there in verse 41 when Jesus prays. Look there in verse 41 up on the screen. We read, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. Notice all the verbs of what takes place in that verse. Later in Mark, on the night when Jesus is betrayed, he takes bread once again. Chapter 14, verse 22. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. Do you know those are the very same verbs used in both of those sentences? What does this mean? It means the breaking of the bread in the feeding miracle foreshadows the breaking of the bread in the Last Supper, which in turn points to the brokenness of Jesus' body for us on the cross as he gave his life to atone for our sins. And friends, just like bread must be broken and ingested in order for it to nourish our bodies and give us life, in the same way, we must behold Jesus broken for us on the cross and take him in by faith so that we can have his abundant life. Here's the bottom line. The road to a satisfying, abundant life runs straight through the cross where Jesus died so that we could live. And listen, if you will just see him there with the eyes of your heart, see him there starved and broken for you on that cross, By seeing that, you can be filled and made whole. And this is the secret to finding the truly satisfying life that we've been talking about. This is the secret. Here it is. We can only have it when we come through the cross where Jesus gave us himself. And you must be willing to receive Jesus himself if you want to have his life. Are you trusting in Jesus by faith today? Are you receiving his spiritual nourishment and life in your life? Friends, any other food will leave your soul empty. Let's end this sermon this morning with Jesus' own words in John 6, 35. Maybe we can hear these words afresh. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Amen. Amen.